Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is Michael Oslin. I'm a resident scholar here. Uh, we are thrilled to have you join us for an event today that is a little bit unlike what we usually do. Mostly we're concerned with what's happening in, in the city uh, this, this day and what's going on in the White House or the Congress. But we, we thought today it was a, a good opportunity to take a, a step back from all the headlines that we've been reading uh, and try to put some historical perspective on what we know that we're, we're talking about and, and facing today, and to tie it to a unique historical anniversary. Um, if you uh, are paying attention to the news, as I'm, I'm sure you are, uh, it seems that we, uh, we live in a, a world of increasing chaos. We have a dissatisfied and pessimistic and, and cynical electorate at home that questions whether government is any longer effective and working, whether this city can solve the problems that our country faces. Uh, voter, uh, voter approval of Congress is at all-time lows. Voter approval of the President is at all-time lows and the like. And uh, it seems that the, uh, the perception of a, uh, a system that is unable to respond to the challenges is growing daily. Uh, we're obviously not the first nation to face that and, and objectively, of course, uh, compared to times in the past, uh, we are, are facing problems of of much smaller magnitude. Then you can contrast that or compare it with what's happening abroad and, and the sense again that the, a system that we've understood, that we've known, that America has been a, a signal part of is also falling apart. Whether you look at Ukraine, you look at the Middle East, you look at the challenges in Asia, uh, and, and questions abound about whether the United States has the, the wisdom to understand what's happening, the will to respond to it, uh, the ability to work with allies and partners to keep the stability that we've come to expect. Uh, and again, we're not the first nation to face this. And objectively, we could say that there have been many times in the past when uh, the situation has been far worse than today. But we also just celebrated two weeks ago, or commemorated two weeks ago, the 2000th anniversary, the bimillennium, of the death of one of the truly transformative figures in world history, Caesar Augustus, the first emperor of Rome who also lived in times when it felt that the world at home and abroad was falling apart. Uh, an undistinguished, unknown teenager rising to prominence in the civil wars in Rome and creating a, a new world, and a world that we today, 2,000 years later, still think that we know and understand and watch in the movies and on the TV and read books about. So we thought it'd be a little interesting today if maybe we could try to tie these two together. Maybe we could talk a little bit about just how significant and serious the problems we face at home and abroad are, uh, where they might be going and what we might do about it, but then shift, pivot, uh, to talk about the legacy of Caesar Augustus, uh, this person who created a system that endured in one form or another for at least 400 years in the West and, and some would say 1,000 years in the East. What lessons? Are, if any, are there from Caesar Augustus's life? Uh, what do we not want to do that he did? What do we want to consider uh, learning? And more importantly, can we just get a bit of historical perspective today? So we're going to have two panels this morning. Uh, we're going to start off with a panel on contemporary events, uh, and then we are going to shift to a panel that looks more carefully at, at Caesar Augustus himself. Uh, the first panel, which I'm going to turn over to in just a second, is led by my colleague, here at AEI, our resident fellow and director of the Maryland Ware Center for Security Studies, Tom Donnelly, and, and it is the Ware Center that is hosting this today. So we're very glad you have joined us. Uh, we look forward to a good discussion and a good uh, question and answer period. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Uh, well, thanks, Misha. Thanks particularly for the thoroughgoing introduction. That makes my job even easier. Uh, you may ask why we are here. <laughs> Uh, we are here to pose problems for the second panel. So we're here to throw hand grenades in the oatmeal in hopes that uh, Misha, Adrian, and Josiah can uh, police up the mess. Um, really, that Misha was quite correct in saying one of the reasons, other than seeing how far we could stretch the anniversary uh, trope, uh, that we wanted to do this event uh, was the sense that, particularly for um, uh, elites today, there's, there's really a sense of unraveling. I mean, one only has to read the op-ed pages or listen to the Sunday talk shows uh, to see um, uh, a leadership class kind of staring itself in the mirror and wondering what's gone wrong, why the world isn't behaving the way they thought it would. Um, and so um, we thought we would 
pose that as a starting point for our conversation about Augustus, uh, not coming either to bury nor praise nor uh, draw uh, too tidy uh, lessons in parallel from uh, the Augustus experience, but really to use it as a benchmark for contemplation to, to better think about um, uh, where we might be today. Uh, we're really lucky to have uh, two very engaging uh, speakers this morning. My is also an AEI uh, hit parade here. First of all, uh, we have Jonah Goldberg, my column, or my column, my column, my column, my comrade here at AEI. Uh, also a distinguished columnist for NRO, National Review, and many other publications. He's well known to everybody. And then my friend Jakob Gerkel, who teaches at Johns Hopkins SICE. Uh, so. Um, I'll leave uh, everybody to sort of introduce their own remarks to make their own way through this, uh, uh, this rather innovative uh, uh, panel. Uh, everybody, the, the format will be pretty traditional. Uh, panelists will make some opening remarks. I'll exercise the uh, tyranny of the moderator to poke them and prod them a bit, and then we'll have a general discussion for, for a few more minutes afterwards before uh, uh, we get to the main act. So Jonah, if you will kick us off. Sure, I'm just going to stay seated here. That's, uh, uh, right. I, sounds reasonable to me. Um, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. I'm confused why I'm here, but I'm delighted to be here. Uh, last night, we had did, well, all of us went out to dinner to talk about the panel, and it became uh, very clear to me very early on that there was really no point in cramming um, when it came to Augustus. It would be sort of like quickly running to Wikipedia to debate Einstein about physics um, after having dinner with Adrian and Josiah last night. And so I'm just going to use Augustus as a, as a, as a, catch, as a jumping off point. Um, you know, it's not so much that I'm ignorant, as Ronald Reagan used to say about liberals, it's not so much that I'm ignorant about Augustus and classical Rome. It's just that uh, everything I know about it is probably wrong. Um, and so best not to speak about it much at all. But I am a, a big fan of history and of the the interesting twists and turns of history. Uh, the sort of legendary philosopher of history, R.G. Co Collingwood once commented that every generation has to rewrite history for its own purposes. And uh, I think that's largely true, but not in the way that it sounds. This is not like an argument about the living constitution or something. Um, in fact, what, I, what I'm getting at is that I'm sort of fascinated by the way the present changes the past. I don't mean that necessarily in a purely literal way as in sort of defining laws of physics in time travel, but I don't mean it in an entirely figurative way either. Um, for example, for most of our lifetimes, pretty much all, almost all of the 20th century, 1917 was the most important date um, of the 20th century because it looked like it was still an open question of whether or not the sort of statist Marxist model was going to one day triumph over the earth, and it was our existential enemy in, in, um, in the Cold War. But come to 1989, all of a sudden, 1917 doesn't become insignificant, become, but becomes vastly less significant. Because instead of being an ongoing question that we have to engage with, it becomes a historical question that we have to think about, but, and it may have relevance for our lives, but it doesn't have the kind of pertinence. Meanwhile, on, say, 9-11, we saw that all of a sudden, maybe the most important date of the 20th century was 1932, when the Salafists unified Saudi Arabia. Or maybe it was 1923, when the Ottoman Empire came apart. All of a sudden, as if, and it turns out that if we are, in fact, an existential struggle with Islam or some variant of it, or if there's a clash of civilizations, according to the Huntington thesis or whatnot, um, then those dates suddenly become much more important in our lives. Uh, one of my heroes was Seymour Martin Lipset, the great social scientist, and he always said that uh, history is the mother of all social sciences. And I, I think what he meant by that, at least in part, was that history is basically a constant and perpetual and eternal unfolding experiment about the human condition. And it is constantly, is the one thing that we can always return to to inform ourselves about uh, where we're going and where we've been. And it's the only experiment that never ends. And as a conservative who honestly believes that there's nothing new under the sun, I think that's a very useful way of thinking about things. And so uh, I think we're in a very interesting moment right now uh, where I, I, certainly no time in my lifetime has sort of the Fukuyama thesis that democracy is inevitably going to triumph seemed less a guarantee. Uh, almost entirely overlooked um, 
couple months ago, a month ago, Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary, gave a, a speech in which he said, uh, we need to basically give up on uh, democratic liberalism or liberal democracy, and we need to in, instead embrace illiberalism, a new illiberal model. And he cited Vladimir Putin, China, Turkey, as uh, the people who were really, as, as the, the strong horses in the way to organize society, and that, that perhaps the superior way to go is to sort of get rid of liberal democracy. It was kind of interesting, he also said that I don't see why that should mean we have to leave the European Union, even if we're gonna get rid of these things, and that's a great problem for the European Union to deal with. Uh, but I think it's, one of the things that's fascinating about it is that for most of the last 50 or 100 years, even the most egregious dictatorships and, and uh, totalitarian states had to use the language of democracy. This is one of the points that Fukuyama makes, right? I mean, North Korea today, which is basically an abattoir slash jail, uh, still calls itself the People's Democratic Republic of North Korea. Um, Yasser Arafat always had to talk about how he was a Democrat. Uh, Stalin, uh, the Soviet Union, all of these places, they used the language of democracy. They were what social scientists call lying, but they found it necessary they, they, they found it necessary to lie because democracy was the only thing that had legitimacy. And in the last 10 years, both abroad and, and at home, democracy is losing its legitimacy, at least rhetorically. And one of the most important things about rhetoric is that rhetoric is the, is, uh, is the way we say, is the way we communicate what our ideals should be, whether or not we actually have them or not. And if you read people like Thomas Friedman, if you listen to people like Barack Obama, um, the contempt for democracy and the shortcomings for democracy um, are becoming more and more apparent. You know, I mean, Thomas Friedman, I, 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 simply as a columnist, I take offense to Thomas Friedman because I try to mix it up every now and then, and I think he just has sort of an F10 macro on his computer where every three months he has to vomit up some sort of piece about how China is awesome and is better than us. And this whole idea of authoritarian capitalism, of managed capitalism, that the Chinese have a better way of doing these things, um, has been getting more and more credence. And I think one of the reasons for it is that domestically it seems like democracy is not, democratic, liberal democratic capitalism is not up to the task that it has been assigned. And the problem is it doesn't necessarily mean it isn't up to the task for, to which it's been assigned, but it seems like it. And there are lots and lots of people in America who feel there must be a better way. And so uh, the Augustinian, Augustine, is it Augustinian or Augustine? I don't know. The, the, <laughs> Augustus's model, um, which seems like an interesting historical chapter, but nothing more than that in a lot of ways to a lot of people, may in many ways all of a sudden be coming to the fore um, once again as the, the sort of zeitgeist of the West says, hey, maybe we actually do need a strong man to run things. Uh, and again, as a conservative, one of the things I think is sort of fascinating about this continuing unfolding experiment of, American, of, of, of human history I think the fundamental insight to conservatism, if there's gonna be a, the pithiest definition I can come up with, is that human nature has no history. That essentially that every generation, you know, Hannah Arendt had this great line where she says, every generation, Western, Western civilization is invaded by barbarians. We call them children. And what she meant by that was that we start over with every generation. Every generation has to be taught to be, has to be civilized. Civilization is, is, is part of the verbs to civilize. And if you don't, and it's why Ronald Reagan always used to say we're only one generation away from tyranny. And as the, the, the liberal Western consensus around democratic capitalism starts to erode around the edges, um, the Augustan model all of a sudden seems like it might be more relevant. And I think there are other things that we can draw on from the history of Rome that might be relevant to today. Uh, one of the reasons why I think liberal democratic capitalism seems to be failing is that the same dynamics that always plague uh, human systems, because they're all run by humans, because human nature has no history, is the tendency of guilds or tribes or elites, whatever phrase you want to use, to rig the system to defend their own interests. And so whether you're talking about the great noble families of ancient Rome or if you're talking about public sector unions or you're talking about the crowd, the transnational progressives who go to Davos, um, this, there is a growing sense, and I think it's a legitimate sense, or a realistic sense, that the system is being rigged from within to reward those who have access to the system. 
um, uh, one of the points I always try to make when I talk to college students is that complexity is a subsidy. Because the more complex the society is, the more rules and regulations it has, the more you reward people who have the wits, the wherewithal, and the lawyers to game the system. And, and this is the one thing I think that both the Occupy Wall Street crowd and the Tea Party crowd, whether it's, you know, whether it's the, the Thomas Piketty, who I'm not a big fan of, or if it's, you know, Michelle Bachman, who I'm not a great, huge fan of either. But, um, but, but they both have the same insight, and I think they're right, that there is this sense in which the system is being run for the haves in a way that it hadn't been before. And that creates its own sclerotic dynam dynamics that can cause the undoing of a nation and an undoing of a civilization. And when the system doesn't work anymore, you look to a strong man who can come and fix it. <coughs> I, I would predict that over the next 10 years, we hear more calls for an uh, Augustan figure to come in and clean the stables and fix the system, because the system seems to be failing for a lot of people. That's it. Jonah, that's a great start. Um, uh, Jakob, so if the, the age of the strong man is again returned, I, I, I certainly do believe that modern dictators could match Augustus body for body, whether they could govern uh, as moderately as he ended up governing is another question, but uh, Jonas put an interesting proposition on the table. Please carry us forward. <laughs> well, thanks, although I'm not going to continue along the same line, right? Well, I guess I was asked to speak also about more about the international situation. So Jonah covered the more domestic internal aspect, and I'll uh, talk a little bit more about the international one. And look, I mean, not to, not to denigrate the panel I'm on, but really we're just a warm-up act for what follows. Um, and, you know, the task is actually fairly easy, right? I thought about just bringing the newspaper and saying, you know, here's the situation. I can't find a newspaper. You know, I, I can show you on the little screen. Uh, you know, the front page news are, are uh, quite worrisome. And um, um, it does appear like there is a great unraveling or almost chaos, as, as Misha said. I would just clarify that actually I don't think it's chaotic, the situation in, in the international affairs. I think there's a growing disorder, but it's slightly different. Chaos, seems to me, it implies um, that there's, it's impossible to make sense of what's happening. That is impossible to uh, understand the reasons for why certain actors, states, leaders behave in specific ways. Uh, why? Because they act in a random way. I don't think that's what we see. I think we actually see um, a very rational, fairly predictable behavior on the part of states like Russia or leaders like Putin, states like China, Iran, or groups like um, ISIS or ISIL in the Middle East. And the question to me, and that's what I want to just do quickly in the next uh, five, ten minutes, is why? What, how to make sense of this unraveling, this great disorder? What are the rules of the, of the, the new rules of the game? And the second is, what, it, what exactly will we be seeing? Uh, how do we know that this is what's happening? Um, look, in terms of why, why we have the front page news that we have these days from, from abroad, is I think there's a remarkable convergence between two things. One is revisionist aspirations, aspirations of states like China or Russia that want to revise the existing status quo, and a permissive international environment an environment that allows them to behave in this specific way they always wanted to behave. So the first part of this, I take as given. We always have states, actors, leaders that are not happy with the status quo, are not happy with the rules that have been established in international relations. Um, Putin made it abundantly clear that he was always um, unhappy with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and he's actually quite sincere about this, and he's acting upon this. He mentioned that for several times uh, and for the past more than a decade. And we kind of thought it was just kind of a quirky thing to say, you know, when he was running around half naked in Siberia. Uh, but no, he actually meant, meant that. He always had this aspiration. I think the same is true for China, that always has this perception of almost a historic injustice of having lost a certain amount of prestige and influence in Asia. Same for Iran, always had made it abund abundantly clear that it was not happy with the status quo in the region and actually much more wider than that and wanted to alter it. So my point is, they're always 
there, in international relations, you always have challengers, you always have competitors, you always have barbarians at the gate that want to destroy what you established, the rules of the game that you have formulated and implemented. And, you know, and one way to think about them is they're always skunks, right? So Iran, Russia, and China are sort of like the big skunks of the international system. They're always there. The question is, what do you do about them? And here's the second part about the permissive environment, um, which I think over the past couple of years, but in particular over the past couple of months, has become much clearer. And it is a permissive environment uh, that we, we as in the United States, Washington, have established by choice in many ways. Um, what did I mean by that? Well, I think we have allowed Washington, the US, this administration has allowed the perception that we are not interested in several regions of the world, that um, we are not gonna intervene in those regions. And uh, even if we're interested in those regions, somebody else will do the job for us, that we can subcontract the stability or the stabilization of specific regions to other countries. And the outcome, therefore, will be positive for us. I think that's quite visible in the Middle East, in the Syria case, to a certain degree now even in Iraq, uh, where we're saying, look, other states have a greater interest than we do, and they have the capability to do so, including Iran, by the way, and they should do it, and we don't have to do, we should not intervene and fix the situation. Same, frankly, in Ukraine. I think we expressed unwillingness to compete in the region in Ukraine, and, um, and we thought that somebody else, the European Union in this case, would pick up the slack and compete for Ukraine with Russia. Obviously, that was not the case, and we're paying the consequences of this. Um, why is it that we have sort of created this permissive environment? Um, there are multiple reasons for this, and they have been widely analyzed, but the bottom line is that we're much more inward looking than we were before for a variety of reasons, again, partly because of uh, budgetary cuts, but I think mostly because the administration has a certain preference for domestic projects and things that you can sort of put foreign policy and external affairs uh, on a back burner. Um, and it justifies that view uh, by um, really united, uniting two visions of international relations, which start from very different premises, but reach the same conclusion. And the two, two views are, on one hand, is sort of the traditional liberal view of international relations, which argues that really the world is a harmonious world, and we have partners to solve common problems. It's sort of like, you know, the world is a puzzle, and you solve the puzzle by working together to achieve the end. So. We don't have competitors, we don't have challengers. We have only uh, the need and the desire to seek partnerships with other states to solve global common problems. The other view, which starts again from different premise, premises, is the view that you know, the world is not harmonious, but it's self-balancing. And actually our intervention in different regions, whether it's Central Eastern Europe, Middle East, or East Asia, messes up a little bit that self-balancing mechanism. And therefore we're better off by not intervening because the balancing will happen there. The outcome of these two different views, which I think sort of Obama has, has managed to, to, to keep in his head together, so like it, maybe that's a sign of being a genius, having two views that very start from diff different assumptions but um, converge in the same outcome. The, the outcome is really that we don't have to do anything in international relations, that the world will fix itself by itself without our presence. The outcome of that is that all these states see a permissive environment, and they can create their own rules, establish their own rules, intervene in countries, break countries as they wish, because no, but there's not, there are very few consequences for doing so. In some ways, you can look at sort of the revisionist skunks of the international system as the perfect embodiments of, of Obama's uh, presidential campaign slogan, yes, we can, <laughs> right? They look around the world and say, yes, we can. We, you know, I, I, Putin, can invade Ukraine. What are you going to, nothing is going to happen. Yes, we Chinese can harass American planes. Nothing will happen. Yes, we can, Iranians, we can run around the Middle East and kill people, and Americans including, and there are no consequences for it. Um, second quickly point, quick point is, okay, what, what do we see? Um, what are the outcomes at, at the end of the day? Um, let me just make two quick points on this. Uh, the first is that it seems to me, you know, one, one can look at, it, at the situation and in the world, international relations right now, as almost a period that is, you know, traditionally was called the interregnum, 
It was a period between kings. When you didn't have a king, and there was usually some moment of disorder because people were fighting for the position of power, that's one way of looking at, at, at this moment. There's a lack of clarity to what the rules are, and whoever has the power and whoever has the will can establish the, those rules, maybe in their neighborhood, in the region, but perhaps in the larger um, uh, arena too. Um, and it seems to me that there is a view from the administration that this is not a dangerous moment uh, because there are rules that do not need um, maybe Julius Caesar or Caesar in general or a king um, to implement, that these rules are called in different ways and, and norms of behavior, 21st century behavior, I think in sort of John Kerry's world, that these are sort of these rules that are there. We all share them and we're all going to behave according to those rules without the need of somebody actually reminding you that you should behave that way and if you don't, there are costs for misbehaving. You know, another term for interregnum, and I use here the canon law of the Catholic Church, as the term is sede vacante, when the pope dies, the seat of the pope, of the bishop, is vacant. It's not, not, nobody is in place. And usually, you know, in some moments in history, that moment of sede vacante in between popes was dangerous because people were fighting, but by and large, it tended to be peaceful because there is a shared sense of uh, what are the principles that we agree on, the doctrine, uh, international relations, you can look at it as this shared sense of legitimacy. I think Obama in many ways, and you know, it's, it's the Roman Catholic guy, he thinks that the world is, cannot afford a sede vacante, absence of a leader, because we all share same principles and sa same uh, uh, sense of legitimacy. I think that's, that's fundamentally wrong, uh, because all these terms, international relations, tolerance, values, order, uh, legitimacy, are empty terms and they're empty vessels that are waiting to be uh, filled. So last point, what we see at the end of the day, I think is a return to um, old terms like frontiers, or to use the 1950s terms, gray zones. Regions where it's unclear what are the rules or who implements those rules. And I would say, you know, we have three at least, Middle East, Ukraine being the other, the second one, and third, especially South China or East Asia. Growing areas where there's a growing sense of conflict and this is becoming increasingly more violent because the rules are no longer clear and there's no longer a uh, clear enforcer of those rules. The Texas border seems like another place. Right, yeah, no, right. Uh, well, Jen, I am going to go <coughs> back to you and ask you if you can sort of connect, uh, I think actually the quite uh, uh, precise uh, structural uh, or international uh, uh, situation and, and problems that Jakob laid out to uh, the point that you made about the sort of philosophical moment of failure of faith or something, you know, however you want to uh, sure. summarize uh, the, the sort of loss of willpower uh, in the West. Uh, yeah. See those as being correlated. Sure. I, I, I want to pick up on another point that Jakob makes. I, I, think he's ex I think Jakob is exactly right when he talks about, you know, I've been meaning to write this sort of jokey column for a while now about how we've just sort of kept, kept secret this vast, incredibly powerful country called the international community. And any minute now, it's going to come riding in and fix all of these problems. Because if you, if you think about it that way, when you listen to Barack Obama talk about the international community, he makes it sound as if it's a thing. And that it, it is actually just waiting to fix our problems, when in fact there is no thing called the international community beyond you know, sort of a shorthand for a bunch of, you know, cookie, cookie pushers who meet in hotel lobbies in, in Paris and Switzerland and whereon. Um, and, and, but when you listen to Obama talk about these things, he says, you know, the phrase this administration loves the most is wrong side of history, right? As if there's a right side of history. And uh, Robert Conquest has this great line about the wrong side of history. He says, there's a certain Marxist twang to it. Uh, because it assumes that there is this in Hegelian inexorable force behind history that will work things out. Whenever Obama runs into a problem that he doesn't want to deal with, he says, well, you know, don't worry. The, arc, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice, which is another word, in a, another way of saying we don't have to do anything because it'll fix itself. Um, and uh, the same thing goes with this 21st century behavior kind of language, this idea that there's something just in the air 
the moment you tear the calendar, the page from the calendar, and you flip into another century, all of a sudden human nature isn't what it was 20 minutes ago. And you know, Barack Obama says that the one thing we can all agree on is that we have no that that ISIL's behavior has no place in the 21st century, as if simply the date on the calendar has this force to it. Which my whole point is is that you know this is a very Whiggish way of looking at at history, as if there is something inherent in the movement of time that changes human nature, which it doesn't do. Um, in terms of uh, you know Tom's point, I, I do think you know one of the most obvious things that from my perspective, that our big problem in the West is, is that we were lacking civilizational confidence. Um, we just don't, maybe you, we, were, we talked about this a lot last night about what's going on in Great Britain with the Scottish referendum. You know, this, this, there's no, there's been no, as Adrian was making this point last night, there's been no effort to teach the Brits to be proud of being British. So there's no sense among the Scots about why they should want to stay British when they're actually proud of being Scottish. And we have the same problem, uh, you know, across college campuses where we are, we are taught to be instinctually anti-American, anti-West, um, to think that the history of America is a history of great evil deeds and nothing else. And uh, you know, it's, it's Chesterton who says the dogma is really important because you know, the purely rational soldier will not fight, the purely rational man will not marry. Um, at some point, uh, you, need, you need to have a com commitment to some ideals and principles um, that get you out of bed in the morning. And uh, the whole language of liberalism, the whole language of, of modernism is anti-dogmatic, which is itself a kind of dogma. In fact, it is the more authentic kind of dogma because dogma coming from the Greek means seems good that which you take for granted. And there's this sort of dogmatic view that the United States is, ha, has no leg to stand on when it preaches to other countries around the world. I mean, it's amazing. I wrote a column recently talking about how ISIS is evil, which seems to me the moral equivalent of spreading a column about how water is wet. Um, and I, you would not believe the amount of flack I got from all sorts of people saying, you know, who are we to judge? Who are we to use words like evil? And I was like, walks like a duck, talks like a duck, crucifixions, beheadings. You know, I mean, if you believe, even in the subjective standards of, of sort of uh, secular humanism, tolerance and compassion and all those kinds of things, ISIS fails that test, never mind you know, notions of objective morality. And yet we have gotten ourselves to the point where we cannot even use the language of evil, of moralism, to describe objectively evil things because we think it's hypocritical for us to do that. And that is something that I think is a real intellectual rot that creates real problems, that will create real problems down the road for, for America and for the West. All right, now John has pissed me off. He's impugned Wiggery. <laughs> uh, alas, I can only turn to the Catholic among us to, to, to defend. But it is, uh, it is a, uh, a kind of question that's uh, implicit in, the, in your opening remarks, Malcolm. If the crisis of confidence or whatever the motivation, at any rate, if there are opportunities for uh, would-be strongmen to chip away at the liberal international order, how can we imagine that the liberals who have been running the world, not the Whigs, but the, you know, the, the postmodern uh, liberals of the current generation might stabilize the world without themselves betraying the principles that presumably made the, the American empire a, a truly eternal one, or at least in the minds of uh, its conceivers. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a great answer to that, but you know, what, just to respond by linking to what John has said, actually, in his uh, introductory remarks, one of the things that struck me over the past, say, two years, or probably longer than that, was that a lot of liberals in the U.S. were saying democracy is not good to solve, I think it was an article in the Republic, came by some of the, one of the White House advisors said, like, democracy is not good to solve the problems that we have, and therefore we have to abandon democracy and have a great leader, a, you know, the great men to fix problems. Like <laughs> 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 um, so, you know, there, there's, there's a, this, this, um, this authoritarian, totalitarian temptation, which I think stems 
directly out of the view that, that liberals have in, in this specific case. Um, but you know, it seems to me one of the problems is, is again, to, to go back to Jonah's point, is that, look, I mean, this idea that history does not need um, uh, us acting, we don't have to do anything because history just goes in a straightforward path towards paradise. Um, it, it's really sort of a, a childish view because it's, it's an abdication of any responsibility, right. right? I don't have to do anything. It's sort of like, the, you know, kids say, I don't have to study, you know. And it's as faith-based as saying God will provide, right? It's the same, it's that still it's the deus ex machina, right? I mean, there's this idea that there's some outside force that will fix everything so I don't have to do anything. Right, but the outside force is not transcendental. It's just right. here, somehow, somehow us will just, without any, kind of having think to, to think about this either, right? right? right. Um, which, which leads me to my second point here that in response to this is that I think there, there from that, you have two separate problems which are linked. One is a problem of willpower, and the other one is a problem of capabilities, right? And the willpower, on the one hand, you can say, well, it's fixable because you alter the leadership and you say, a new leader will say, I can act. But here, the problem, I think, is becoming deeper. It's not just a problem of one specific individual. I think it's a, it's a problem there civilizational, again, going to, to um, John, is that we're uncertain of who we are at this point. And we used to make fun of the European Union, which is always a great target for jokes, right? They, they can't figure out what they are. When they're debating about the Constitution, the Constitution became sort of this amorphous thing. So now we can't mention anything about history for the past, you know, well, maybe we can mention the Enlightenment, but nothing that preceded it, nothing that really was parallel to Enlightenment, because that's not what we are, essentially erasing European identity, right? And that was a great target of jokes. But I think we're going in a, a similar direction, different different ways, but similar direction. We, we don't know who we are. If you don't know who you are, you really have no willpower to act. You, you don't have a justification to act. Why should you act if, for instance, you think that you're equal, morally equivalent to everybody else, right? So one problem, specific problem to me, is assimilation. You usually assimilate people because you think that there's something better that you can offer. Not necessarily just language, but way of life, sense of sense of principles, uh, respect of life and all that. If you don't have that, well, you can't assimilate. Why would you assimilate somebody that you think is exactly the same, if not superior to you? You can't do that. So the willpower, I think, is more problematic than just one individual. A second problem, I know I'm being, being pessimistic, but a second problem, I actually you like that. The second problem is that capabilities, you know, if you don't have the willpower, you'll cut the capabilities, specifically defense capabilities. Why would you need defense capabilities when the world will fix itself, right? Um, well, you know, that, that's, you can fix it to a certain degree, but I think it's becoming harder and harder because catching up is, is not easy. So, you know, that's why I think you'd like it. I think that's a big mistake. We should increase defense budgets. Well, there you have it. We are utterly without hope and without, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, but we're conservatives. We're allowed to do that. That's our fundamental view of human nature. Um, we've got about uh, five or six minutes left uh, before we before the appetizers get off and the main course comes on. Uh, but be delighted to take a few questions. Yes, sir. Uh, if, I'm sorry. If you'll wait for the microphone, that's just for transcript purposes. Gerald Chandler. Uh, let me ask you if uh, a stitch in time saves nine, or the other way around. If by Barack Obama and the political class now does nothing, in other words, doesn't do the stitch in time, how much are we going to pay later? A lot. Um, look, I mean, first of all, there are two more years um, of the administration, which is actually a pretty long period of time. But the second thing is, is you know, if you look at, um, say, Ukraine, just to give you an example, right? It, it looks limited, small, it's only part of Ukraine, Putin is not assaulting NATO, is not assaulting yet directly the European Union. But these small changes actually have an enormous impact because they alter fundamentally the perceptions of what is, a, what is permissible, what is not. And those perceptions are incredibly difficult to change back uh, and incredibly costly to do so. Look, I mean, to me, the idea of, of Putin invading parts of Ukraine is not just about invading Ukraine. It's actually poking a finger and checking, well, is NATO really for real? Right? Is it a real promise? And what he's getting back is probably not as real as we thought. Right? The perception of that entity, NATO, has dramatically declined. Not because it had promised anything to Ukraine. There are no security guarantees to Ukraine. But it's clear that NATO cannot respond to the type of attack and the type of continued slow motion attack that 
that Putin has, has done in Ukraine. So perceptions have altered fundamentally. How do we change them? I don't know. It's going to be a long, long process of rebuilding these changes. Another way to put it, to be even more specific, extended deterrence or deterrence in general, right? The ability to prevent some action by threatening retaliation, it's all in the mind of people, right? It's a psychological game. And that has fundamentally, in my view, altered in Ukraine, but it's altered in large measure in the Middle East, and it's altering in, in the East Asia and, and the Asian theater. Um, rebuilding this is going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort and be very costly. That, that's part of it. I mean, that, that will be the, the, the more, more positive and benign view. I hope it's not costly in terms of increased violence. And I'm, you know, to be pessimistic, I think that that's where the world is going. I think it's, it's not going to stop at these small little wars. I think it's, it's you know, it, it's, it's like a snowball effect. You start slowly because you're not sure, you Putin, you China, you're not sure how far you can push. Then you push a little bit and you say, well, it's not that bad. I can go further. I can go further until you in, engage in, in, a, in a strategic interaction which spirals out of control. That, if, if you wanted that cost, that's going to be really costly in terms of not just budgets, but actually violence, destruction, and lives. And that's, that's my fear. Uh, let's talk to the gentleman in the back first. Uh, Ken Meyer Court, World Docs. If there were a foreign leader who uh, we didn't like, who ruled by decree and had the power to execute his political opponents at his own discretion, we would call him a thuggish dictator. But doesn't that describe Barack Obama? Are we part way down the road to, towards the strong man? Uh, go ahead, John. <laughs> yeah. The, <laughs> Over to you, big guy. <laughs> yeah. My, my, my short answer. I mean, uh, my short answer is no. Uh, my slightly longer answer is sort of. Obama is not ordering the execution of any of his domestic political opponents, right? But presidents have always, in a sense, had that power. What, what, what has constrained them is, is the dogma of the American system, which says that if you do that, there will be enormous consequences. And I, I still think that to this day, you know, I wrote a whole book about fascism, right? And uh, uh, the, the part of my thesis in that book, and I still believe it is true, is that the, the Orwellian Hitlerite version of fascism is never going to come any time in our lifetimes to this country. Uh, you know, the, it, the Orwellian vision of a jackboot stomping on a human face. This country will chew up and spit out any, you know, uh, Pinochet type of character. Um, but there's another vision of fascism, which comes from Aldous Huxley, which is this idea of, um, which, you know, 10th graders have been writing term papers their entire lives trying to answer the question, what's so wrong with the brave new world? And they can never come up with a good answer because everyone's happy. And there is, um, there is a sense, I think, in this country um, that the government is there to satisfy all of your needs and wants. And I get it, getting back to this European Union point, uh, the history of progressivism in the United States going back over 100 years basically boils down to there's nothing wrong with this country that being more like Europe wouldn't fix. And um, uh, I think that if you listen to the rhetoric of Barack Obama, it is, it is pretty martial and pretty dictatorial, but it's amazing how people won't pick up on it. I've been writing this column a lot. You know, the, the, the moral equivalent of war arguments inherent to liberalism come out in Obama's statements all of the time. After, uh, Osama bin Laden, after he killed Osama bin Laden, I don't know if you guys heard, but Barack Obama killed Osama bin Laden. He mentioned it once or twice. Um, uh, in his State of the Union address, he said, Why can't, wouldn't it be better if this country was more like SEAL Team 6? where we all put aside our individual wants and desires and unified like a military unit that only did what was best for the country. Now, it was an incredibly Spartan vision of what America is like. And, you and it, once you start listening for the moral equivalent of war argument, which has defined liberalism going back to Woodrow Wilson straight through the New Deal, um, you can see what the ambition there is. That the American, you know, and my view is that this completely overturns what this country is supposed to be about. The whole idea of this country is that we have a strong national, we have a strong national defense, we have a strong army to keep the domestic sphere free. We don't have a strong army and national defense to provide a better example for how we should live our own lives and drop our petty associations and rally around the flag. 
and this cult of unity that defines liberalism um, is, is, is purely a statist vision. And so I don't, I, but so much of the sort of hallmark card rhetoric rather than any actual, you know, there are no prescription lists. Obama's not going to be killing anybody in this country, won't put up with that. But it will put up with, for this, with this slow, artery hardening um, uh, infantil infantilization of the American people. I mean, the, the life of Julia campaign ad that the Barack Obama campaign came out in 2012, where every frame begins with the words under President Obama and goes through this woman's entire life as defined by what the federal government gave to this woman who has no family, has no husband, no parents, um, has a kid who disappears when he's 18. The creepiest sentence in all of American public life in my lifetime was the frame that began, under President Obama, Julia decides to have a child. It, just, it makes me feel unsafe. But, um, but that rhetoric works on people. There's this increasing idea that the state is there to take care of people. And um, it is not a dictatorial thing in, 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 the, in, the, in the Orwellian sense, but it is a dictatorial thing a little bit in the, in the Huxleyan sense. Just to add, so it's not dictatorial, but it's a, it's a totalitarian temptation. Mm -hmm. And that, by that, I mean the state becomes the totality of life, right? right. The state and government under President Obama, Barack Obama, it's the sole supplier of anything of order in particular, right? Julia has no family, right? right? Doesn't need a family because it has Barack Obama as the government. So it's not a dictator in the sense of, you know, prescription list, but it's a dictator in the sense of, or dictatorship in the sense of that th there's nothing but the state. If the state disappears, if the government disappears, we'll be slaughtering each other, which is not true, right? Right. I mean, I'm not gonna kill Tom if the state disappears. I like him. Right. Uh, I, you know, we have friends, we have families. We're gonna provide for them in many ways without the state. Right, and Mussolini's definition of fascism was everything within the state, nothing outside of the state. And he's actually the guy who coins the term totalitarian. And it wasn't supposed to be a bad term or a mean term or a cruel term, it was supposed to be holistic. Everybody belongs, we're all in it together. Well, Yaakov, I'm gonna get you first, so don't worry about <laughs> it. Uh, thank you for your uh, indulgence. Uh, we need a strong man. And certainly Caesar Augustus fit that profile. So, gentlemen, let's have a quick transition, and uh, thank you very much. Great. Well, as, uh, as we are switching and getting everything uh, set up, that was uh, far from the appetizers, but uh, I think one of the, uh, the, the best uh, concise uh, you know, discussions we've had here in a long time, clearly something we could have done an entire, an entire morning on and expanded, and, and, and maybe we'll come back to that. But it, it set us up perfectly, I think, to, to look at some of the big, deep issues and not you know, what the upcoming midterms are like. Or, or such, and so we're gonna we're gonna pivot now uh, and go back 2,000 years, actually uh, a little bit longer than that, and try to talk about um, Caesar Augustus, uh, some lessons from his life, uh, maybe just learning some new things, uh, and maybe even putting it into context for today. And to do that, uh, we have two of the the finest, truly leading young classicists in the world, and it's a particular thrill to welcome both of them here at AEI for the first time. Uh, on my far left is Josiah Osgood, who is an associate professor of classics at Georgetown University here in the city. Uh, the author of a number of books, his first book, however, uh, perfectly uh, tied to what we're talking about today, Caesar's Legacy, uh, the, the settlement of the civil wars and how the Roman Empire emerged from Cambridge, 19, uh, 2006. I highly encourage you to get it if you haven't uh, got it yet. And to my uh, right is Adrian Goldsworthy, who I think a lot of you know uh, as one of the foremost um, popular writers, if I can use that in a, in a positive sense, popular writers of Rome, uh, having written uh, a, a good number of books that cover uh, starting off with military history but expanding out and 
Uh, most of you have probably read his Caesar uh, and some of the other books, including uh, Antony and Cleopatra or In the Name of Rome, but just released, uh, perfectly coinciding with the 2000th anniversary, is this new uh, book, Augustus, uh, one of the first full-scale, really full-scale biographies of Augustus in uh, recent memory coming out from Yale. It's on sale right now, so I certainly hope you will uh, be able to pick it up and, and add to the discussion today. Those of you who get National Review, I have a, a review of it in this, uh, I think it was last week's edition of National Review, and the reviews are starting to come out, so you can time that with, uh, with reading the book. So it's a, a great pleasure to welcome both Adrian uh, and Josiah here, and I think we're going to kick off with uh, Adrian. Okay, um, it seems to be on, so is working. Um, obviously, my comments, and I suspect Josiah is going to be far more about the history than drawing modern parallels. And I think the last thing you want is some Englishman coming over and telling you how to run your country. Um, I think we tried that a couple of times in the past. It didn't didn't go well, did it? So, um, however, let's begin because obviously one of the last questions raised this question of the dictator who is uh, supreme through monopolizing military force who kills people. And Augustus does fit into that category. So let's begin with a couple of judgments on him, both written by Roman senators later on, so after his lifetime. The first one is one that is very peculiar to um, modern ears, but I think fits with some of the introductory stuff. And this is from Dio, who was writing in the early third century, who is of Greek extraction, Greek's his first language, but is also a Roman citizen is also a senator. And he was talking in this case about Julius Caesar rather than Augustus, but it leads on to his judgments there. And he said, democracy indeed has a fair appearing name. Monarchy has an unpleasant sound, but it's the most practical form of government to live under. For it is easier to find a single excellent man than many of them. For it does not belong to the majority of men to acquire virtue. Indeed, if there has ever been a prosperous democracy, it has in any case been at its best for only a brief period. So. Um, Given that Dio had actually lived under emperors like Commodus, he's the, um, the nutcase in the movie Gladiator, if you're familiar that way, and Caracalla, who also gets up to all sorts of things, his experience was not actually of terribly good emperors. So he did, he began his career under the tail end of Marcus Aurelius, who is considered to be someone who is a decent man and a good emperor. So he doesn't, you know, it begs the question, yes, you can find your single excellent man, give him all this power, and he can do things, but what happens if you give all that power to someone who is less than excellent? And that perhaps is obviously the strength of democracy, is that at least we get some choice in the matter, whereas once you have an emperor, short of killing him, there's no way of getting rid of him. The other judgment is much more cynical. This comes from Tacitus, who is again a Roman citizen, but the family has some Gallic origins. You know, ethnically, the, neither of these people are what we would consider to be Roman, but that's true of the overwhelming majority of Roman citizens. And his judgment is a lot harder. Augustus, he says, seduced the army by bounties, the people by the free corn dole, the whole world by the comfort of peace, and then gradually assumed the power of the Senate, the magistrates, and the making of law. There was no opposition, for the bravest men had fallen in the line of battle or to prescription lists. So later on, you do have this sense of ambiguity, of uncertainty about Augustus's legacy, particularly amongst the Roman elite. Now, it's quite clear from Augustus's story that he does fight his way to power. He kills a lot of people during the Civil War periods. He raises an army when he's just past his 19th birthday, or slightly before, and is a private citizen, has no legal power whatsoever to do this. He has the name of Caesar, and he has a lot of financial backing. Mark Antony at the time dismissed him as a boy who owes everything to a name. Because he was Caesar's heir, self-proclaimed as Caesar's heir, he was the main um, recipient of uh, in his will, but he wasn't his adopted son, not legally anyway, this is something he assumes. Um, and anyway, you couldn't bequeath political power at Rome, that wasn't the way it was supposed to work. But he assumes that, and is just this teenager. And he raises a private army, and because it's a quite a good private army, a lot of these soldiers are some of the best trained men in Italy, because they're troops that had been raised by Julius Caesar. The lots of the officers that have fought under Caesar are there. So these, this is a strong factor in the balance of power in a civil war situation. He's employed by the Senate under Cicero's lead. He ends up fighting against Mark Antony, then joining Mark Antony. Together they form the triumvirate with Lepidus. They introduce the prescription list. They draw up death lists that are posted in the forum. Now, there were probably a couple of thousand names included on the prescription list. Perhaps a tenth of those people actually died. 
Now, it's all very well to say, well, of course, 90% of people on these death lists escaped, so, you know, it wasn't too bad. Um, but that's a bit rough if you're one of the 10%. And the whole point is he did, they were responsible for the deaths of several hundred people, at the very least. And that's the formal stage of the massacres. There are others in the civil wars, and the great victories of these years are fought against fellow Romans. Now, you cannot assign all the blame for this situation to Augustus, nor indeed to Julius Caesar. The civil wars have been ongoing. They've been a fairly frequent feature of Roman life since 88 BC, so that's more than 25 years before Augustus was actually born. That's the first time a Roman army is turned on the city of Rome, marches in, seizes power by force. And that's, again, we were talking a little bit earlier about how once you cross a line, it's very hard to go back to that situation where everybody assumes that you can't behave like that, so they don't. The self-imposed discipline. After that, every Roman politician knows that his opponents might well use force against him. They might well try to kill him. And that fear is constantly there. Once the young Augustus stood up and said, I am Caesar's heir. I wish to inherit all his power, all his rights, and I'm going to avenge him, then he was either going to get killed or he was going to succeed. There was no other option. You could not step back from that. So victory was the only way to stay alive. He behaves no better but no worse than all the other warlords around at the time. Um, you could think of Shakespeare and Brutus and Cassius talking about liberty when they've murdered Julius Caesar. Um, Appian rather tartly says that Brutus, the day later, gives a speech to the people who assemble by the Capitoline Hill in Rome talking about the return of freedom, and then they issue out a bribe to the people. And he says, well, you can't expect the same people to rally to freedom if they'll take your money as well. And the, the liberators, Brutus and Cassius, the other conspirators, behave no differently in raising armies illegally, in fighting against other Romans, in screwing the provinces for every penny they can get to feed that war effort. So there is no, there is virtually no ideology. That's the only time in Rome's civil wars where Caesar is murdered because of this, this resentment of one person with supreme permanent power. Briefly, there is an ideological element. All the other civil wars are fought purely about personal power. And that's true as well when you come into the, the later civil wars that will destroy the Roman Empire. So Augustus is no better than no worse until he wins. From 30 BC onwards, after Antony and Cleopatra have killed themselves, he never again faces a serious threat. And he does that by maintaining strict control of the military. He turns the Roman army into a permanent professional force that is loyal to him. The soldiers take a, an oath to him. So no one can oppose him. And he takes good care as well to make sure he not, doesn't get murdered, as Julius Caesar had. But not to the extent of being inaccessible. There are plenty of stories of Augustus walking through the streets of Rome interacting with ordinary people, and often using humor in these situations. He was a very accessible emperor. If people had really wanted to, they probably could have got to him. Um, but they don't want to, because even in the Tacitean judgment, he, um, what was the quote? He seduced the whole world by the comfort of peace. Augustus returned stability to the Roman world that it had not had for at least two generations. And that wasn't just the instability caused by civil war of massacre, it was confiscation of private land, private property to give out as gifts, rewards for the soldiers. Whole communities were stripped of farmland. And this could happen to anybody. You didn't need to have been on the wrong side in the civil war, it could simply happen to you. The provinces suffer even more. They are continually um, forced to subsidize the, the armies that are formed. And that's especially true of the eastern provinces, the rich eastern provinces, the eastern Mediterranean. Countries like Egypt. Cleopatra had never, ever fought against Rome. She was a loyal ally of the Roman state. Her problem was that power kept changing so rapidly at Rome that she never knew who she was supposed to back. She's conveniently politically for Augustus to say, we're fighting foreigners, there's this threat from the east. But Augustus, um, that was just, he didn't want to say we're fighting Mark Antony, yet another Roman, yet another civil war. Everyone was exhausted. You can see it. This is something Josiah illustrates very well in, in his book. You can see it in the desperation of the poetry of these years. They just want peace. They just want stability. They want to be able to get on with their own lives. They want to know that if they own a farm, they can bequeath it to their children. It will still be theirs a generation on and beyond that. And it's true in Rome. It's true in Italy. It's true throughout the provinces. Augustus stops killing people once he's got supreme power. And in a weird sort of way, actually, people are more grateful because they know that he could always start again. But the restraint imposed upon him is not through a strong opposition in the Senate. It's not through fear of assassination. It is self-imposed. He behaves as he thinks a Roman politician should. 
and he keeps supreme power and he make very great care, takes very great care to make sure that he does, but he works well. He spends more of his life touring the provinces than he does in Italy, let alone Rome, and he answers petitions. We hear of embassies coming to him from as far afield as India when he's in Spain in 25 BC, and that's the first of several um, embassies from India. You get deputations from the tiniest little communities, think they can go to where the emperor is, queue up, and they will eventually get an answer to their petition. And it's mostly setting things right. It's establishing precedents. It's re-establishing the rule of law, knowing who is in charge, where, what rights you have, what you don't have. And Augustus labors for the state. So he is a very active um, leader in that he sorts things out. And this is something that has been a big problem, and I'll finish with this, which does have some contemporary relevance, but is far more extreme in the Roman experience. Under the previous system where the Senate was supposed to guide the annually elected magistrates of the state, an immense inertia had developed at the heart of Roman government that had lasted for a good 50, 60 years. And problems would come up time and time again, whether it was what to do with the unemployed in the capital itself. Rome is this great bloated city with a population that rises to a million, massively bigger than anything else in the ancient world. A lot of those people don't have permanent employment. What do you do with them? How do you stop them from rioting? How do you try and solve this problem and not simply have to feed them free grain every year and give them various other things? What do you do with your armed forces? Your recruiting legionaries no longer from the propertied classes, but from the very poor. They go off, they fight, they risk their lives for the state, and you pay them very badly. Julius Caesar can double the basic salary of a Roman soldier, and it will remain like that for centuries. It doesn't seem to bankrupt the state or anything. It's just the original pay was so low. And once they're discharged, they have nothing. They've come from the gutter, and as far as the state's concerned, they will go back to the gutter. Doesn't matter what they've done in the meantime. Um, the Senate does not want to deal with these problems because it doesn't, no senator wants a rival, another competitor in the system to get the credit and the fame and the gratitude for having solved the problem. So it is better to let these problems that everyone acknowledges exist continue rather than let somebody else solve them. Augustus, through the Civil War, through all that's happened, through all these bad things, this is a state that is in a much worse condition than anything in the Western world today. But he does go in and he starts solving these problems. He sets things up, he creates a system that will work. The problem, of course, is, is that then you go on, that's a good emperor, but what happens when you get a bad one? Adrian, wonderful, thank you. Josiah, please. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah, good. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to meet Adrian uh, Goldsworthy's books. I've been reading for many years now. He really is the uh, leading military historian of Rome of, of our generation. So it's, uh, I recommend his books, uh, many of them, to all of you. Uh, what I want to do in, in my few minutes here is build on what Adrian was saying and uh, put Augustus's career now in, in a bit more of a larger context. I mean, I think it may tie in with some of the points we heard in the first uh, session this morning. So it's important to remember in the centuries leading up to Augustus, uh, anarchy really was, uh, by some definition, the norm in the Mediterranean world. Uh, in the West, uh, in Spain and Gaul, you had a pattern of tribes constantly raiding one another's lands. In the East, the Greek city-states for centuries had been vying for honor and military conquest. And after Alexander the Great took over the Persian Empire, his successors, kings like the Ptolemies of Egypt, they continued this pattern as well. For the Greeks, empire on the whole was something that you should seek and you could take pride in it. Uh, Julius Caesar, some of you who studied Latin will have painful memories of this, <laughs> took his uh, decade or so to conquer Gaul in the 50s BC. And really, I think, by the end of that, this pattern of anarchy was essentially over that I was describing um, earlier. Rome was now the, the superpower. But the problem was anarchy took over, had taken over in a new form. And essentially, in my view, what happened was as Rome acquired an empire, wealth started to flow in. This was what allowed, for example, the city of Rome to grow to such a massive size. The plunder, the tribute of empire flowed in. And it led to uh, serious political destabilization. 
And this, I think, ties in a little bit with the point made earlier uh, in the first panel about complexity. Rome became a more complex society with interest groups who started to fight over the spoils of empire. So city dwellers in Rome said, we don't want to have to buy grain on the open market. The prices fluctuate way too wildly. It's a little bit like uh, gas oil prices nowadays. Grain prices in antiquity have that same uh, ability to, to spike. Uh, so they ask senators to subsidize their grain. Some senators want to, others don't. And the Senate starts clashing uh, with one another over such questions. And as Adrian said, they also start clashing over problems in the empire itself. Because the other thing the empire brought was unexpected military crises. Uh, in Spain, for example, the Romans were there by, let's say, about 200 BC and uh, kept constantly having to go back because of tribal insurgencies in wars that became ever less popular. In the East, after the Romans toppled kings, uh, diminished the powers of city-states there, piracy grew and spread. And to put down the pirates, uh, the Roman Senate and the Roman people really finally took measures um, uh, to enact uh, a strong man, Pompey, to go there and finish off the problem. So military um, crisis, in other words, of the empire started to necessitate a new type of leadership beyond these pairs of annually elected consuls. Uh, the problem is these strongmen grew to have really the resources of whole states themselves. They essentially had the armies that were the equivalent of those of a state. And when they started to quarrel, they engulfed the whole Mediterranean. And that is this pattern of civil war that we've been talking about here. So um, Augustus, let's bring him uh, onto the stage now. Augustus, unlike great uncle Julius, Julius Caesar, uh, Augustus knew pretty early on that he had no talent as a general. And this actually proved a blessing because he decided he could only win glory in a way that uh, Caesar never would have thought of. His ambition was going to be to end political anarchy in Rome. And to do that, he saw that he had to stabilize the empire. He saw that the two were closely related. Caesar wanted to be the new Alexander the Great. Uh, Augustus, this is a story that I think sums the man up well. Uh, Augustus, somebody came up to him one day and said, you know, Augustus, Alexander the Great, when he was 33, he was told, well, Alexander, now that you've conquered the world, what do you plan to do with yourself? And Alexander said, uh, I have no idea. Uh, Augustus smiled a little and said, I'm surprised that Alexander didn't think that the administration of an empire is a much more difficult task than its mere conquest. And that really sums up Augustus. He was a tireless worker. The iconic image of Caesar is Caesar on horseback with his scarlet cloak riding into battle. Of Augustus, it's of a frail man sitting on a couch specially equipped for study late into the night, making sure all of the day's business got done. And he just was a tireless worker. He didn't neglect, though, to spend time socializing with others who had talents he needed. Uh, Augustus loved to gamble with his generals. And I think this was a very wise investment of any money that he might have lost in these games. Smart uh, crowd to win over. So how exactly did you know, personality aside, how exactly did Augustus uh, end the political anarchy? How did he stabilize the empire? Adrian's mentioned some of this, uh, but let me just emphasize a couple of other points that I think are important here. So of course, the new institutional framework, which was developed importantly over time and in dialogue with other elements in Roman society. Augustus would become the head of state it really was not possible to let the Senate continue to manage uh, the urgent military crises. The record of failure was just too extensive. And the writers of the US Constitution, of course, understood as well that legislatures have difficulty managing urgent military crises. So Augustus became 
the commander in chief and in charge of the armies, in charge of foreign policy. But he kept the Senate alive and going. And this wasn't just window dressing. This was a way for him to reward supporters, to bring new men, men of talent who'd been shut out of the old Roman Republic into government by giving them a spot in the Senate and the chance to command one of his armies. Less immediately obvious, and I think this is actually one of Augustus's more important lessons, actually, was the way he handled bitter memories of civil war. We've heard the rap sheet already. Uh, terrible prescriptions. Cicero, Cicero, the greatest order, the great Republican statesman, was brutally executed uh, in Augustus's very early days uh, of power. The historical record shows us across uh, Rome, but even in other periods too, civil wars are extremely hard to end. And they end differently than foreign wars because you have a victor and vanquished having to come back together and reconstitute a shared society. And even if they've won on the battlefield, victors may still lack legitimacy and very often rely on post-war terror to keep their grip on power. Franco in Spain is a good example, or in Rome before Augustus, the warlord Sulla. Even when victors and vanquished can reach consensus on the form that post-war society takes, some groups may react against it, as, exam as uh, for example, the Ku Klux Klan did in the American South. And civil wars, as we've mentioned, lead to atrocities. Justice for these typically won't be available. And yet, the victims or their relatives are living alongside the perpetrators of the crimes in many instances. So Augustus faced this problem of reconciliation. And a key part of how you handle that is how you handle memory. And the problem is if you delve too much into painful memories of the past, you reopen the wounds. And Caesar is a good example of what not to do. He came back to Rome after one of his civil wars to celebrate a great triumph. And he had paintings displayed showing the suicides of his enemies. Suicide on some level was a dishonorable thing, so he thought that these enemies of his in civil war had disgraced themselves. But this caused extraordinary offense in Rome. It was the sort of offense that built up leading to his assassination. Augustus did not repeat mistakes like that. The problem, though, is at the same time, there's a line from an Augustan rhetorician. He said the best defense of civil war is to forget it, to just completely bury the wounds. But that doesn't entirely work either, I think Rome teaches us. Societies do need some way to acknowledge their losses. And this is what Augustus and those around him really, I think, were actually quite good at figuring out. Let me give just one example. Augustus's poet Virgil, in his great epic poem, The Aeneid, he reflected on all the losses of civil war, but he did so by setting it in a mythological narrative set in the Homeric world. So I think the best defense of civil war against civil war is to half forget it, not to totally forget it. So, yeah, sure. Is that better? Good, thanks. So in building consensus, let me just make one or two more points here quickly. Augustus celebrated Rome's empire, absolutely. And in this same poem, the Aeneid, right, the great king of the gods, Jupiter, proclaims, for the Romans, I set no limits, world or time, but make the gift of empire without end. But do not take such language too literally, as some historians, I fear, have. In fact, Augustus, like the architect of the Athenian empire, Pericles, was very concerned to set limits, to think about borders and boundaries. Augustus's typically homespun advice, I love this, he would say in this context, don't go fishing with a golden hook to describe wars that would cost more than they would ever bring in for you. Sound advice. But also along with this, it wasn't just kind of jingoism. Augustus emphasized Romans' duty as world rulers. And uh, Virgil picks up on this again in the Aeneid. He says that it's the Roman's task to pacify, to impose the rule of law, to spare the conquered, battle down the proud. 
And I think this too, again, was in the spirit of Pericles. As Thucydides has Pericles say to the Athenians, you cannot enjoy the privileges unless you also shoulder the burdens of empire. So there's celebrations, but also a call to duty. And what Augustus was trying to do across the whole empire was to make Romans proud to be Roman again and give themselves ways to identify as Roman with symbols, for example, like the symbol of the crown of oak leaves, which you find all over Roman art on, on serving dishes, on funerary monuments. It's a little bit like the bald eagle that you see on an early federal desk. It was a symbol that all could use to recognize their Romanness. Augustus staged games more lavishly than anyone before him, but he tied these in to civic events, to the worship of the gods. So Augustus, Augustus, I think, was a very majestic figure, but also unassuming. And that was a secret of his success as well. And what I would like to emphasize most as we mark the anniversary of his death is how hard he worked at learning how to lead. It did not come naturally to him. In his early days, he acted too much like a Greek god. He would dress up like Apollo and eat luxurious dinners, sort of in the style of, of a Greek king. Um, and he, in his ambitions to set new foundations for Rome, knew and realized he had to give all of that up. What he achieved was not perfect. Intrigues plagued his court and later imperial courts. But he created a precedent that was a valuable one for Rome's future leaders. Augustus was unflinching, I think one of his greatest virtues, unflinching in his willingness to think about what is it going to be like when I'm gone? What is going to happen after I die? What will the situation be? And I think even more than his own extraordinary achievements in his lifetime, it's the centuries of peace and prosperity that followed that are Augustus's vindication. Josiah, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you ended with uh, the question that I wanted to open up with, and then we'll, we'll turn to the audience. We've got about a uh, little over 10 minutes. Um, you uh, talked about Augustus working very hard, and you, st you stressed that a number of times. And, and the question I wanted to uh, ask, maybe pose to uh, Adrian first, uh, is uh, in, in the biography, you, you certainly portray him. One of the ways that Augustus has been portrayed is you know, unlike the, the very emotional Mark Antony and, and the sort of uh, the, the, a Caesar who didn't see maybe f forward enough in terms of what you do when you've, when you've uh, stopped the fighting. And of course, he was about to go off to another war when he was assassinated. Um, Augustus has always uh, or often been portrayed as having a plan. You know, he, that's what part of the genius was he was, had a plan. And you portray him as, as very much not having a plan and, and being one who, who, who puts it together on the fly. And I'm wondering uh, if that in a sense was part of his genius, or uh, was it something that, that caused more uh, cost and disruption over time? How do, how do you assess his, his understanding of where he wanted to go and what he wanted to do? I think the, um, the comparison with Julius Caesar, um, I think is often an unfair one, because Caesar has so little time. And the situation in 44 BC when Caesar is murdered, people tend to compare it to post-actium for um, Augustus, and you know, he doesn't return to Rome for over a year after Dracdium. He's had more than a decade of supreme power before he's got there, and much of that time he's been in Italy and Rome. Caesar has been fighting the Civil War, and in terms of working all the hours there are to try and sort things out, Caesar is also doing the same thing. He becomes unpopular because he's dictating to scribes, he's dictating correspondence whilst he's watching the games. He's checking his Blackberry. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Augustus makes sure he doesn't do this. He's not seen to do it because the people want him to enjoy. They want the sense that you know he's put this entertainment on. So there's, we can be rather unfair to Caesar. Caesar didn't have time, and we don't really know what he wanted in the long run. But Augustus is short of his 19th birthday when he, he steps into politics, and I don't see a clear indication. As Josiah emphasized, you know, he learns about leadership. I think he is like Caesar and probably like quite a few of them, he does, he believes in the state, he believes in Rome, he wants it to work. You know, it, this is not, he does want power, he is certainly ambitious, they both are, but they want to use that for the common good. They feel that is, in a sense, the justification of, of possessing it. Glory is one thing, but you need to use it. 
Augustus clearly doesn't have this rigid template of what he expects his regime to be and is working towards that. There is a period of several years, more, nearly a decade really, of experimentation. Does he hold the consulship every year and only let one other person be consul? Well, the aristocracy starts to resent that because that means you know, there's less opportunity to get the high office. The problem is that at election after election, people keep writing his name on the ballot, but even when he wasn't standing, because people believe this peace and stability is so tied up with Augustus keeping power that they are desperate for him to stay there. And you have case, you know, he's offered the dictatorship. And it, it's very odd. Again, there's this sort of scholarly attitude. We always suspect Julius Caesar of being insincere. We tend to believe Augustus. Caesar famously at the Lupercal, Mark Antony offers him, you know, the, the crown and, um, and he refuses it. And everyone thinks that, oh, well, it's just a bit of play acting. Augustus has the same thing when the people come to him and he's supposed to tear his toga and weep because he won't be made dictator. Um, but there is clear, you know, nobody quite knows what the world's going to be like. This is all new territory and it's, it's so easy. We often, there is a great danger academically that we divide history up and particularly for courses where we're teaching students. So we'll sort of have a course that finishes with Caesar or maybe finishes with Actium. Then our course on the Principate, on all the emperors that'll come later on, begins with Augustus. And we very often anticipate, you know, with hindsight, that's what's going to happen. Nobody knew that. And, you know, in Augustus' case, he suffers several serious bouts of illness that it is extreme to see as just play acting to make people sort of value him. You know, he nearly dies on several occasions early on. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Um, and I think in many respects, his idea for what the, the regime he was creating was going to be is changed by his successors, particularly by Tiberius. There is something different emerges. He always seems to want to have not just a single leader, but a sort of group of close family members, allies that he can send out to, so that whilst one of them's in Rome and Italy, someone is out in the provinces, or two of them can be at different ends of the empire, all working, all doing this constant laboring to set things going again, to get the state uh, um, working. So. Yes, I think it's a learning process. I don't think he goes into politics with this ideological sense of this is what the state should be. I will make it conform to this. Um, the Romans tend to be more pragmatic than that anyway. They're trying to make things work. They want stability, they want peace, but they want it to, to function. Um, and I think he works towards that through various trial and error experiments. He's not afraid to learn from his mistakes in the same way that he's not afraid when he realizes he's not good at things like leading an army in person to get people who are and make sure they're loyal to him. And to involve as many sections of the community, the class below the senatorial order, what they call the equestrians, tend, end up playing a much greater role in the state under Augustus than they ever have before. They're given military commands as part of this new professional line. They're tied into the system. He involves people at all levels, and there is that strong sense of, comes back to something earlier, self-belief. And the one, paradox of it is, is that he keeps presenting this as a return to traditions. Not in any sort of rigid institutional sense, but the fact that you know, Augustus celebrates the early myths of foundation. He sets up in his forum that he builds the other side from the, for, uh, um, well, the other side of Mussolini's road now to the, the main forum, these statues of the Sumi Viri, the, the greatest men of the Republic. There is a sense this is the logical culmination of all the greatness of the past. And he happily invokes Alexander the Great alongside Periclean and Athens. You know, Salamis and the defeat of, of the great Persian king with the conquest of the Greek. Anything in the past that is good is invoked as part of making the present better. We need to live up to these standards. But it is restoring this confidence in themselves, which is an important part of it. Hi, I'm Tomas Astrid. I'm a colleague at, of Josiah's at Georgetown. I just wanted to ask you, said something about his plan for the survival of the regime. Whether or not it's true that he chose Tiberius so that he would be regretted by the weaknesses of his successor, why do you think this, they so colossally screwed up the question of succession over the following generations and never really created a working system? Um. Oh, that's what I thought. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. Uh, so the question is about the succession. And uh, 
essentially the most important point is Augustus shied away totally from ever, ever, ever explicitly announcing a principle of hereditary succession. Um, and instead found all these indirect formulas to indicate whom he would like to succeed him. So um, he would adopt um, uh, a son, but also share various, uh, Tiberius ultimately, but he also would share powers, various sorts of powers that Augustus himself had. And these, this precedent tended to be followed. I think it was um, uh, a fixation of Augustus's own mind, that it was too monarchical for a four-year-old to become the emperor. And this is what happened in later Roman imperial history when a hereditary principle of succession was much more entrenched. In the fourth century AD, you start to have children as emperors. That just was not Republican. And it just too flagrantly contradicted uh, the ideals of the old republic. So there was this kind of imperfect compromise um, in, in Rome. Um, I think it's important just very quickly to add, though, others wanted hereditary succession. The people in Rome, the armies, they were much more in favor of this because they saw that this would, pro they thought this would provide more stability. So Augustus kind of pushed back. And it's the sign, I think, um, that he's not a, a total demagogue. I mean, he has his own ideas of how he wants to do certain things and pushes back sometimes against the people of Rome or his armies or other groups in society. Go over here. Just trying to fill in for Misha. The gentleman in purple polo. Hi, I'm Jesse uh, Weinstein from American University. Um, I have a question for Adrian. Uh, conclusively, do you believe that uh, Augustus Caesar was a man of his time or the time was of Augustus Caesar. He could not have happened had it not been for Julius Caesar. You know, Mark Antony is right to some extent to say this is a boy who owes everything for a name. He, he couldn't have become significant as a teenager had it not been not just for Caesar, but Caesar's murder. And in an odd sort of way, it's Augustus who makes the name Caesar important for the, the centuries to come. That's why you had a Kaiser and a Tsar in the 20th century. Um, rather than Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar might have just been relegated to, to another Pompey, another Sulla. Um, but he, his entire career, and that's true to a great extent of the Pompeys and the, the Caesars as well, when you've got this level of instability, this level of infighting of civil war, the normal rules don't apply. There are both opportunities, but there are also far greater dangers. So Augustus couldn't have been Augustus without all those decades of chaos beforehand. So it's, 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 yes, he was a man of remarkable talents, but like Julius Caesar, people like this, had they been born, say, at the time of the war with Hannibal, if they didn't get killed in the early battles, probably would have been quite famous as a leader later on, and then just gone on to an ordinary career. It's, it's a sign of the times. Adrian, you mentioned the conditions that brought about Augustus Caesar politically and that the Senate was a sclerotic body that couldn't accomplish the problems before it. Couldn't help but think of a modern analogy here to today. Maybe you can go further with that and see if it is a good analogy or not. I, it's, it's good in a sense in that there does seem to be in a lot of Western countries that inertia, if for want of anything better. There are serious problems. Everybody admits to serious problems, but nobody actually wants to do anything about it. Another thing that I think is a striking similarity is that the reason they're not doing anything about it is rivalry with each other. And I do find it quite depressing. It's certainly true in Britain, and I, uh, my impression would be here as well, that there are so many people who define themselves not by what they believe in, but what they hate, or the people they hate, and the group. And uh, uh, the entire political career is focused around not being those people, which somehow makes you virtuous. Um, and in Britain, you have a sense with the last few prime ministers that they, they want to be in office and they want to be prime minister, and then they'll make up their mind what they want to do about it. But they don't come in with any clear sense. Certainly in Britain, I mean, the last person with any sense of that was probably Margaret Thatcher, who had an idea. Now, obviously, the country was in much more serious mess then. It was clearer what needed to be done. But agree or disagree with her, her various methods, I can't help thinking that when historians are talking in a century or two times, she's going to be the only prime minister from my lifetime so far that anyone will remember. Um, 
and I fear that's you know that's generally the case. A lot of people are just going to be you know small footnotes in history, and yet they've been elected to these high offices without a clear sense of of what they want to do and what how that what what would be success? How how is the state running well? How is um, that expressed, that, you know, that tends to focus on small things. Oh, I want to do this, I want to create this, or I want to make that change, or, or the, the natural, well, it'll just all just happen. Um, so it's very easy, though, because, as um, Josiah was saying, by this time, by later on, the Romans are not facing any serious rival. And you have this complacency when you are so strong and successful and rich that on the whole, nothing really bad is going to happen to the most ordinary people in their lives. We may moan about our political leaders, but we, as with most of us, you, you, your, your life is spent about earning a living, looking after your family, doing all these things. That goes on anyway. Um, it's just the, the situation that allows you to do that as well as possible may be decaying, but that decay isn't very quick. And it tends to come, you could look at similar pattern with the, the, the steady decline of the Roman Empire in the third and fourth centuries. Most people can keep on living their lives, it seems okay, because there's nothing to push it over. And that's probably still true in the short term. The modern world is that the country is not going to collapse into anarchy and civil war. It's not going to be invaded and physically overrun by anybody anytime soon. But that doesn't mean those things can never happen. And that doesn't mean that you can simply rely on the fact, well, we've been strong once, so we always will be. Um, which is, is how the Romans see things. You know, and they're even looking back and you get people lamenting that they destroyed Carthage because perhaps that's allowed them to this complacency, the sense there's no rival to keep you on your mettle. Um, you know, and you, you've had, I mean, odd, now and again, you've got this odd nostalgia for the Cold War at times of a sort of sense, we knew who we were, you know. <laughs> it was all simple. Um, and even referring back to that, you know, the, the tendency that gets invoked, this idea, why can't states combine in peacetime as they can in war? It, it's a you know, a constant theme of the literature of the movies and everything in the post-Second World War period, you know, that we, we did these wonderful things then. But it's, it's never going to happen. It's not, it's not a natural thing. But there's, as I say, people complain, they moan, but it becomes a question of just wanting to make sure your opponents, people you don't like, get credit. And that's, that's an end within itself. And once you get to that mentality, or a significant section of your political class does, then you're in serious trouble because nobody's going to do anything. And you, they have to create the emergency measures that Josiah was talking about, Pompey and his exceptional command against the pirates. Again, most of these people could probably have functioned within a normal republic and just got a bit of glory, gone back, taken their turn. But it, it becomes an emphasis so much on everybody getting a turn that you won't face up to sometimes you need to give someone more power for a longer period to deal with the problem. And then as soon as they've dealt with the problem, everybody is trying to drag them down. And that's... Pompey is alienated, forms the alliance with Julius Caesar, because he comes back having done what he'd been asked to do by the commands he'd been given, and then is immediately, as soon as people realize he's not a very skillful politician, then it's trying to cut him down to size. Rather than saying, We've, this fellow's done good stuff for the state, let's incorporate him in it, let's honor him, respect him, he'll have influence, but he won't have power, and that's the way the state should work. But and th they never let grudges go. And that's the genius of Augustus to make that happen, in, in part because everybody sig significantly is dead. Um, you know, people come back. Caesar returns from Gaul 10 years after his consulship, but people want to put him on trial for his consulship, even though the world hasn't ended because of that. It, it's just this, we've got to destroy him, I hate this man. And it's a deeply visceral personal hatred in many respects. There, there are ideas as well, but a lot of it is just um, they don't like each other. Uh, and that, that becomes a problem. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. I think that's a great way to have uh, tied together uh, the, uh, the politics of, the, of Rome and the politics of today. Uh, I thought those were two phenomenal panels. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and, and certainly thank from my end uh, Adrian and Josiah and uh, Jakub and Joan and, of course, Tom and, and Tom for agreeing to host all this. So thank you very much, and please join me in thanking our panelists.